the board policy second. the board policy second reading the employment of employees educational tours district 128 intergovernmental intergovernmental agreement with the illinois department of health care and family services we will discuss future agenda items and then we will adjourn to go to f and f uh, so, um, how about uh, public comment? Yeah, public comment for a committee meeting. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Uh, yeah, the microphone is on. It'll be easier to hear you. If you don't mind, if you could just tell us who you are, and that's probably all you need. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. okay yes. perfect thanks do i need to give you my address at this point no nope. okay thank you my name is lissa gong i know i have three minutes i practiced um i both work at vernon hills high school and i'm also a parent of a student at vernon hills high school um i know there's a lot of feelings about the current graduation plans for vernon hills and so i just wanted to provide some other thoughts and ideas um knowing that my student will graduate in the next couple of years. I watched Vernon Hills's graduation ceremony with very close eyes this year. Um, there's a lot of teachers present and a lot of staff and ESP, more than what's required to run the event. And I think it's a great opportunity. Um, kids love it. They love having their pictures and the parents love talking to the teachers. Teachers love talking to the parents. It's a really intimate experience. Um, and I think sometimes when the public hears things and community members are concerned, they haven't actually witnessed the ceremony before. So I think that's just something to take into account. Um, the staff that runs that event is phenomenal. Like it is so well done and it is so compassionate. Um, and the, the viewpoint that parents have like from the bleachers to the floor, they can see their kids, they can exchange glances. It's a lovely experience. And I'm concerned that in a large venue setting, you'd lose a lot of that atmosphere. And then we're at the mercy of whatever that venue is and how they handle the AV equipment and lining people up and parking and special seating for people that have um, any kind of visual hearing or mobility need. That's a totally different experience that we can't control for anymore. And I think that puts us at great risk to change the vibe of the entire graduation ceremony. Um, I graduated from a large high school and we had no choice but to have our graduation in a different setting. My grandparents struggled to get into the building and find a seat, even though they had special seating. It ruined the entire experience for my parents. So I just think those are things to consider. I think there's ways to streamline tickets in terms of people being able to get extra tickets from people that don't need all of their four tickets. Um, and if it's a monetary issue where like I'm not really comparing with Libertyville. They will do what they do to serve their students. We will do what we do at Vernon Hills to serve our students. But if people are concerned about the number of dollars being spent per student per graduation, um, then I think that the school board could then spend money on Vernon Hills's kids' yearbooks, their gowns, and their senior party. There's other ways to spend the dollars to benefit the seniors that are graduating in a compassionate nod compared to just spending money for spending's sake. Thank you. All right, thank you. Alyssa, can I ask, have you shared that uh, feedback with Dr. G? Because we are very interested in hearing your voice as a parent and a teacher. Um, we are waiting to hear recommendations back from the building level as to what they recommend. So I just wanna be sure that all of that feedback um, gets to the building level administration uh, because we are not um, governing that decision. We are waiting to hear back on that decision. So please make sure in addition to the feedback that is welcome at the board level that you share that at the building level as well. I will, thank you. Thank you. Oh, time's up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, moving on uh, for discussion, we have the FI 2024 ISP member dues. Uh, our board is a member of the Illinois Association of School Board that provides uh, training services, uh, networking, um, we meet at IASB events. We go to the TRI conference uh, each November. Um, they assist us. They're helping us right now to completely redo our policy. Um, that, by the way, was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, I was working on that this a uh, couple weeks ago. Um, so they charge us for their services. We have an invoice. Dan, do you want to add anything to that? Or does anybody want to add anything to that? 
Um, I would say our membership, it's a professional organization of boards throughout the state, and um, I have found our membership in that organization extremely valuable. Um, they really focus on school boards. Um, they do have a grasp of the diversity of uh, public school districts in the state and seek to serve all of us. Um, they do a lot of free training for board members, new board members, experienced board members um, on a wide range of topics. And I've found our membership to be um, really instrumental in um, keeping all the information that we need to know um, kind of in one place, so. Okay. Um, I guess I can move on unless there's anybody else that wants to say anything there. Well, this is something we'll have to approve at the general meeting. Um, okay, board policies, second reading. Bryant, you can take us through that. These are our uh, board policies for second reading. We did the first reading back in uh, May, and uh, many of these updates are from the last uh, press policy. Um, and currently, we are going through a, 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 a large review of all of our policies, and, and Don was part of that uh, board meeting a few weeks ago, and Carol and I um, sat with IASB. Um, so these will get incorporated into those. Um, next set of uh, policies, these these changes. And I don't think there were any changes from the last meeting. So. Right. This is our second time around. We've already read through these. This is just one more opportunity mm -hmm. for eyes to rest on them. I do have two questions. Sure. We had discussed uh, the language about policy 6230, the Library Media Center. Mm -hmm. I have no issues with the policy. I will vote for uh, adopting that policy tonight. Um, but there is an administrative procedure that goes along with that. Yes. And I am, that has not changed, but nope. can I just get a reassurance that we're going to look at that? Yes. So we wanted to adopt this policy first. I've been reaching out with the librarians. Um, and then um, I'll just review everything with our school board attorney and we'll update that. So there are a few minor updates, but we want to adopt this policy first right, right. that is tied in with it. Yeah, I was I tried to go through the language of that uh, procedure again today mm -hmm. and it just the way the day count goes is yep. not clear. And so we talked about we, that already. We we're looking up. at that. So. Super. Thank you. Uh, and then the board policy eight. Uh, 20 community use of school facilities mm -hmm. there's a wording that doesn't that I'm just not sure about so um, in the first paragraph it says school facilities are available to community organizations during non-school hours when such use does not interfere etc mm -hmm. then in the third paragraph it says Student groups, school related organizations, government agencies, and nonprofit organizations are granted the use of facilities at no cost during regularly staffed hours. Fees and costs shall apply during non regularly staffed hours. So this seems to me to, to bring two different things during school hours and mm -hmm. not during school hours. Or staffed hours. Or staffed hours. Is what they're referring to in that reference okay because we have first and second shift custodians so during non-school hours so outside of the regular school day then in the other one it says at no cost during regularly staffed hours okay so that could just mean Custod I believe custodial, custodial staff and that's not. the way our so then our fee schedule um, and other terms we have that that we give to our renters and um and so those if if they're again during the regular staff hours that we have buildings and ground security there they're not paying anything for those so my question then is because they're separated mm -hmm. um in the first one it says that as long as it doesn't interfere with any school function mm -hmm. or affect the safety I would think that that would apply regardless, whether it's staffed or not staffed, you Correct. would not have them interfere with any Correct. school function. Yep. So that's all I'm, yep. I'm pointing out that it doesn't matter when they're here or who else is in the building, it should not interfere with any school function or affect the safety of students or employees or affect the property or liability of the school district. Correct. So 
if the language says that, then I'm all good, but I can't tell if the language says that. Yeah, so it's saying that we can open it up to our community organization um, during after school hours, so after 3.30, when it doesn't interfere with any of our school functions, um, and affect the property or liability. So if we have an organization wants to come in and rent our facility, again, that rental fee there, we have different structures based upon what they have, but we do look at that first. Is this, this is when, you know, John Fischel, um, our rental coordinator and I look at, um, somebody asking us to use the facilities and we say, okay, we go to the buildings and say, is the building available? Do you have a dance going on that? I do have something going on games. So we look at that one first. And then we go down to, okay, now are we staffed or do they have to then pay for a staff to come in extra? Um, Whether that's, um, we have actually three different staff people that may come in during rentals. Um, So we have um, security, we have somebody that supervises and, you know, is kind of walking around with the group a little bit and helping them make sure they're organized and then buildings and grounds. Um, and if we are staffed during that time, we don't have to double staff, then we try to help offset the cost for some of our organization. Okay. It also says at no cost. So if it's during regularly staffed hours, they would have no cost associated with using our facilities. So that's student groups, school-related organization, government agencies, and nonprofits. nonprofits. Right. But then if you look at, we also have other organizations that are money-making ones, and we'll charge them. So, right. So the, but so, if the local chapter of something that's a nonprofit decided that they wanted to use our facilities during regularly staffed hours, it would, we would give that to them at no cost. Correct. Yes. As long as it doesn't interfere. Yes. But it doesn't correct. say that. That's when we go up to the first one. It doesn't interfere during the non-school hours when it doesn't interfere. So we first, that's our first priority, is does it interfere with anything? That's paragraph one. That's then, during non-school hours. Which is like after 3.30, but we're still staffed from 3.30 to like 10 o'clock at night. Okay. I'm not, I don't want to nitpick. It's just not clear to me. Just because of the way it's written, mm-hmm. it, 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 it seems to say that there's two separate categories. There's non-staffed hours and there's regularly staffed hours. No, no. So the way I read it is that anything outside of the school day, which is after 3.30, if they want to use the facility, they can. But if we're staffed, they can get it for free. So if they, if they want to use something from 10 o'clock at night till 3 in the morning... We're not staffed, and they may we may have to charge them if they want to do like something. You know, I'm just throwing a, a number out there. You know, something. But if they want to do something from seven o'clock at night till ten, we're staffed, and that's non-school hours. Okay. One is saying time of day, and the other is saying fully staffed, staffed or not. Correct. It's almost like two decisions. So would it help to have some language that clears that up? We have all that in our procedures for rental. So it's in the AP. Yeah, so yeah, all of our procedures that we hand out to our renters outlines all of that, and then if they get charged, what they get charged and everything. Okay. Sorry. Good. I have no other questions. Does okay. anybody else have any questions on any of the policies? You're satisfied with the second reading, and we're going to move forward tonight. Ms. Drumkey, it's good to see you. Thank you. I apologize. It's okay. No worries. Do I have enough liquids? So, it's a volunteer <laughs> job. You're not late. Uh, okay, so employment of employees. Mm-hmm. These um, are recent employment employees. Um, some resignations, some replacements for some leave of absence, um, and uh, also for some of our ESP. And we will have, um, and their second page has a list for coaching and extracurricular staff. And we're still in the hiring process, so we'll have more coming in July. Any questions? Okay, we're on to educational tours. Hello, Boston. How come they never take us? (laughs) We ask every time. 
So this is an educational tour, student travel to uh, or for the JEA National Convention in Boston. Um, I don't need to go through that, right? Nope. 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 We just need to see if there's any questions mm -hmm. or discussions among the board. Okay, I don't see any questions see or discussions no. other than can we please, please go? Yeah. yeah. Very well organized right. yeah. Super yeah. request. Yeah. Okay, and then we have an intergovernmental agreement with the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services. Um, Seems promising. Um, you know, in order to recoup a way to recoup funding any from Medicare. additional funding, we'll have to enter into this IGA. It seems like fairly standard legalese wording. Uh, we have several IGAs. I didn't note any questions or problems entering into this one. Does anybody else have any discussion or questions? Are most of our peer districts also entering? Yes. Mm -hmm. Is this a change from the past? Um, like what, what caused this? Because we've never done this before that I remember. I think um, Dr. Ellis Bowen will use her expertise to answer that better than I. So good evening, everyone. So um, basically the change is now um, prior to um, the new changes uh, per the state, um, the Medicaid reimbursement was strictly for students with uh, special services that were receiving services such as OT, um, psych services, we could also um, bill for IEP meetings and things of that nature. Now they have extended or expanded services to any student that is receiving um, some type of assistance within the school that is um, receiving Medicaid. So um, now you don't have to have that IEP designation in order to receive the services. Okay. And it's not insignificant. Uh, no further questions there. All right, we're on to future agenda items. There are several listed in the uh, board packet. Do we want to add a um, update on calendar guidelines at some point? Are we? Yes, in my report, we do. We will have the parent input um, that we received. Okay. So yes, that will be um, the the uh, results will be shared with the board. Great. And then if there are any other questions that the board would want us from our discussion back in May Perfect. or April, um, we would be bringing all of that information back um, to the July meeting and then seeing what direction the board wants to take it from there. Thank you. We will add that. And then that. an update on the graduation. <coughs> when when will we know when they're done? Discussing? I believe the timeline, um, they're going to visit some facilities over the summer. I believe they reassemble the committee of parents and staff members in August. So I don't know. It might be at the August, okay. but if not for sure, by September, we would have an update on the um, Vernon Hills graduation site. Is there any additional work on the grading and assessment uh, initiatives happening over the summer, or is that going to pick back up during the year? We did offer funding for teachers and teams who wanted to be part of the pilot to have some paid time to work on um, what that might look like for their team or to transition some of those that new language into their syllabi. So people who um, volunteered for the pilot are receiving financial support to do some of the work, but in earnest, it will pick up again back when everyone returns. So this is the mini update. Thank you. All right, I'm going to adjourn the PNP meeting. Jim, if you're out there. <laughs> <laughs> Record time. Oh, can, we, can we start FNF yet? I mean, we got two minutes. <laughs> we gotta wait. <laughs> I think we do. I, I'm 100% certain this is the first time that's ever happened. What'd you get? Mm. Yeah. I'm not sure what you're doing. <laughs> it doesn't hey, matter. Well, do note it then. 
Uh, thank you for participating in the um, policy committee. Um, it was slow, but it was interesting. I have a feeling it's going to get slower still. <laughs> <laughs> at least this time we were answering questions. This calls to order the Facilities and Finance Committee meeting for Monday, June 26th. Um, we are going to waive the Pledge of Allegiance until the start of the regular board meeting. But we will be uh, starting with public comment and then moving on to items for discussion, of which there are several. So is there anyone here from the public that would like to speak? Nope, going once, going twice. All right, seeing none, let's move on to items for discussion. Starting with summer 2023 capital projects update. This is always a very busy time for our capital projects folks as they try to take advantage of the fewer students in the building to maintain our facilities. We have a list. Dan, Mark? Yeah, uh, so we have the written report that we included for you. Uh, I guess, Mark, any highlights? You don't have to read through every single one, but anything um, that's major that sticks out? Everything's uh, pro progressing well. Um, there's, as you noticed when you came in, the parking lots got done. They, they were scheduling and I'd done the report and uh, we were Looks able great. to get them done all this mm -hmm. weekend. So uh, that project completed. So. Mm -hmm. Looks great. And I appreciate the pictures that you include. So nice. um, I really just do too. Kind of gives us an idea of where. Idea. Mm -hmm. Great Thank idea. you. I, I appreciate children's it. Book. Yeah. <laughs> it was school construction. <laughs> okay. Any comment questions? Okay. Uh, moving on to item B, the fiscal year 2023 audit engagement. This is something that happens every year, the letter for approval. Uh, yeah, this is our audit engagement for fiscal year 23, similar audit to what we had last year, uh, but I did note the costs are up, like a lot of contracts that we are we have been um, running across lately. Uh, this is up um, partly for inflation, but also just the amount of things that have to get reported on are increasing every year, and this year is no different, so that's affecting the cost as well. So not just their own staffing costs, but also there's more things to have to report on. So uh, GASB 96 is a particular one. That's a new requirement that we have to report. Um, GASB is the Government Accounting Standards Board. They're the ones that decide all the 
all the auditing and accounting rules essentially. And the GASB 96 is about um, subscription-based uh, software agreements. So if you have a multi-year agreement for use of software, let's say, let's say we sign a, a multi-year agreement with Google to use Google stuff. Um, normally that, that future cost is not recorded as a liability. It's just that whatever the annual cost is. And they have understandably, and it's actually more correct to say like, you actually have a liability there for multiple years out that we, we should be accounting for. That's really what that is. Um, and so districts like us are going to be experiencing that. So that cost at 56,700, uh, for the base cost, And then the GASB 96 is going to be billed, um, separately based on the hours that it takes them because they don't know it's never been implemented before. So I appreciate that level of detail because when I first looked at it, I thought that looks like it's more expensive than previous years, but understanding that the requirements are increasing, meaning it's going to be more expensive to accomplish that audit. I appreciate the, the detail. Mm -hmm. Any questions? We'll be approving that in a few hours at the regular board meeting. A few hours. Let's do it sooner than that. Yeah. In an hour. I'm sorry. I'm available. <laughs> I'm available to vote sooner. <laughs> Anytime after 7 p.m. How about that? Good. I know. We I love that you all jumped on it that way. <laughs> I know we talked about this last year, and that there's value in maintaining our relationship with Miller, and that it would take we'd be spending more money trying to bring another company up to speed with what we're doing. But is this pretty standard? And and I mean. A 14.5% increase, I know, is also indicative of the responsibilities of the reporting, but that seems to be very high. Is it worth the district looking to seeing if there is an alternative provider that would not be as financially draining as we talked about last year? Um, I don't, I believe this is more of a standard of what you're seeing. I think there's other companies that are, the increase is higher. Because okay. uh, it's context. It's not just the increase, but also the cost. So I think our cost is decent. We're not terribly high, but we're not the lowest either. But a lot of them are depending on, we've talked about this a little bit before, what is the actual final product that's being produced? Is it just the state required audit? Is it something that's fancier? Which is really what we do, the annual comprehensive financial report. Right. That's the highest standard. Uh, that's what we do. So comparing that apples to apples, I don't know that you're going to find um, something that saves you a meaningful amount of money. It might save you a few thousand bucks. It's not going to be meaningful in my opinion. And I got to be honest. Well, um, I know the up the, load cost is going to be substantial. It, not even that, just like a lot of accounting firms are dealing with the same staffing issues. And I don't see us getting better service at this point. Um, so that that's the part that matters to me is getting these reports done in a timely manner. I don't see alternatives that are going to be more successful for us. Okay. Good question. I will also note we had our annual review. Um, Miller Cooper talks to the board president and the superintendent every year. Um, and I've been talking to the same guy and he's incredibly professional mm -hmm. and um, really um, it's great to see how well versed he is with our district, our finances, mm -hmm. our staff. Um, and I do think that's also worth something, as you indicated, mm -hmm. not only just the cost of a transition in terms of time and energy, but uh, the level of professionalism, I think, is um, I'm sure other firms are equally as professional, but I don't think we could do better in terms of professionalism based on my limited experience. Dan obviously could speak more authoritatively on that, but I didn't. I mean, I know you're thinking about it. I just think it's worth a question yeah. worth asking. Oh, saying absolutely. That this is something that we're considering because I know there's also some complacency and we don't want to be in that position either. Agreed. And so and when I, I first saw that, so I was like, actually, I was sending them emails because like, because sometimes the engagement letter might go straight to the superintendent or straight to the board. I was like, as soon as you get it, I want to see it because I'm really curious to see what the numbers are. And as soon as we got the numbers, I was doing a little digging to try to find out like, is, this, is everybody else seeing this? Is this consistent? Um, and then even last year, talking to a couple of districts that changed auditors. And so I was kind of listening to that a little bit, but those experiences didn't go very well. And so I, I think this is, I think this is the best arrangement we have for the work that we're asking for at this time. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Good comments. 
Uh, moving on to item C, a fiscal year 2024 treasurer's bond renewal. This is something that's required by the state. Yes, and this is something that is a 0% increase, which is nice. So it's been flat for a while now. Um, and hopefully it's something you'll always pay for and never, ever have to use. Uh, so this is a treasurer's bond. So state law requires that uh, your treasurer is bonded. I am the board appointed treasurer. Um, and so uh, what that means is uh, we issue a bond and really the bond is between me and you, the board. And so it's, um, and so Liberty Mutual is the surety. So they're the ones that basically, if I did something that compromised um, my responsibilities as treasurer, um, you could cash in those bonds. Liberty Mutual would have to, you would make a claim. Liberty Mutual, if, if it was a valid claim, would have to pay you, and then they would come after me. Um, <clears throat> and so the, how, how you set that is there's guidance from the state that it's right now it's 25%. A lot of times people interpret it as 25% of your year-end fund balance. It's not actually true. It's really 25% of the highest cash balance you'll ever have in the year. And for us and pretty much every other district, um, at least in Lake County, that's going to be October is our highest cash balance. So I look at that and I try to give wiggle room because I never would want us to be in the position of being under bonded. Um, so I look at that and 25% of that. So 30 million is where we've been at. Uh, we used to be a little bit higher, but 30 million, I still feel comfortable after a year. Um, I want to revisit that again. We might be able to go down a little bit, but I don't you I mean, you're, you might save again a few thousand dollars, which is going to be helpful, but I don't want to put you in a position that's going to compromise the effectiveness of the bond. So you're doing it as a state requirement. Also, it's a, it's a good practice that you should have. Yeah, I think we've always been, always been comfortable with a, a cushion there. Um, being a little over insured is better than underinsured. I Any, say we risk it. Hmm? I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> You're just in that I'm mood kidding. today, aren't you? There's no one here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments? All right, that's another item we will be voting on very shortly in the general meeting or the regular You're meeting. You're a fast learner. <laughs> Moving on to item D, drapery cleaning and flame retardant application approval. Uh, so this one, this is probably something that didn't work out quite as how we were hoping it to, but um, I think the solution we have is reasonable. So, Mark, do you want to kind of walk through this? Um, sure. Uh, th the company that we used to use uh, uh, lost their employees, and I think they're out of business. They don't answer the phone. So there's only a few companies in Chicago and area that do this. Um, I believe it's three major ones. And then this is this on-site, which we got the quote from, is a nationwide. Um, we were only get, able to get one of the vendors in the Chicago area to come out and give us pricing uh, besides this on-site. Um, <clears throat> but then it fell into Libertyville's curtains were supposed to be good for another year. So they came in being a new company, had them inspect them, and they failed. So that put us in a position that we have to have them tested this year and cleaned and tested this year. So, so the expense that we would have planned for next year Right. We'll be so this we year, hit, we won't. Not hitting the same year with both schools. So we'll end up working that out in a schedule in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but because they're both coming in at the same time, it puts us over our, our threshold. I'm assuming that all other schools are then um, in the position of using all the other this company. Schools that were, were under contract with the local companies are still. Um, I Apparently, they're not looking to pick up business because they short employees not sure um but one company did come out and they were substantially more expensive uh, for both schools so what is the cycle on the cleaning and, and it's application? three-year cycle it's three and you can renew up to five years at a year at a time so we are trying to renew libertyville and they came in tested and they and they failed okay um so um that's where they both fall in at this point uh we did get um able to use co-op pricing on it um, uh, to um, have this company. And the nice thing about this company is they come with a semi. The local companies take your drapes down. Four weeks later, you get them back. They put them up. Uh -huh. They come into your parking lot. They park their truck. They clean them. They mend them. They do everything on site. It's a mobile facility. Uh -huh. So there's also a cost savings. They're not paying for a building. They're not doing all that other stuff. So. Um, okay. I would say um, 
at Libertyville, um, the other pricing was about eighteen thousand dollars more, and for Vernon Hills, it was about seventeen thousand dollars more wow. than what this pricing is. Okay. Here, so. Okay. And part of the story, the original plan we were anticipating, we would do one building and then re we would do Vernon Hills and then just and recertify LHS for one more year. And so we didn't think we would need to bid it because one building would be under the bidding threshold. We should be fine. When we found out it failed, it was like, oh no, now you have to, we have to bid it because that, that's going to be over the bidding threshold. And, and based on the timeline of getting this done, when, when is it? It's done this summer. It's done this summer. Yeah. So based on the timeline of putting specs together, getting it out on the street and getting somebody back we just thought was going to be a tougher timeline to meet especially okay. during the summer times but being able to access the national contract um allowed us allowed us, allowed us to move forward okay. with that so um it wasn't the ideal situation that we wanted but i think this will work out just fine and then I, also, know you, I know you asked but so we're generally expected to have to do this every three to five years you said yeah every three, three years. years the certification is a three-year certification you can recertify up to five years one year at a time after that so. so we won't see this for another three years we won't see yeah we won't see it for another three years Correct. Got it. okay and i don't know well, if it was said but let's also point out that what we're certifying is the flame retardant mm -hmm. yes like i don't so know if anybody said that here it yeah. failed the test right that's that's a problem right it's yeah. a right. safety issue yeah no i don't think anybody's like disagreeing that we need to do this <laughs> we definitely need to do this no i, I just don't think has, like yeah. we've all read this all and read we know this. it's about right, right. i don't think anybody out there no it's worth it has read it yet the public right. to make so sure a large that's part of the a large percentage of our curtains are what they call flame proof they're supposed to melt but when the dirt and the dust gets on those mm. that's what catches fire um so keeping them clean is essential dirty enough it's like my grill care. this weekend i was cooking burgers and oh, i noticed all of a sudden the temperature in my grill was like beyond 700 and i thought that's <laughs> not normal <laughs> and all the stuff that fell in the bottom of my grill that caught on fire my grill didn't catch on fire so same idea we prefer that and not your grills and, yeah. and yeah. your, your drapes for you the role of the pro tip and then related question semi-related but what is the lifespan of a set of draperies for these stages do you know about how old each set is just out of uh, actually the, most of my there were sets bought not sure in nine in 2019 there was if one school was bought and in 2021 another set was bought not the full set but they are rotating in out. wings yeah I think there maybe you might get 15 years. It okay. depends on the curtain themselves. So wait, if we bought drapes in 21, shouldn't they be under their three-year guarantee for certification? Not the drapes it's a, that failed? It's a, it's a technicality. They say, you know, in the warranty from the manufacturer, because it's flame inherent, that it won't catch. But, you know, when they test it, they were dirty. And so, um, you know, a flames were produced on a surface of itself. So. Okay. So we'll be also voting on that shortly so that you can get going on it and get it accomplished this summer. Any other questions, comments? All right. Moving on to item E, disposal of equipment. There's quite a list here. Yeah, this is summer uh, clean IT. They do it a few times a year the big old list of tech stuff so that's what's listed there mm -hmm. um i gave you the uh sorry john was on vacation last week so i gave you the best that i could figure out how to do this um <clears throat> the information from temple uh about the information and also the the place that they also send it to uh, as well for um disposal okay and that's the recycling the, company that's in the consent vote agenda um, so I know I brought this up before. I would like, is it is it too laborious and time consuming to know what happened to this stuff? Because I know we have sell, scrap, or donate, but we've never seen the follow-up report of what has happened to this. I know it's happened, but like I'm I'm just if it's gonna take too much time, I understand that. But I think we have I know we make our best efforts to try to donate and find something. It just seems like this laundry list, there has to be something that somebody could possibly use. And I would, I would like to see what happened to it. Uh, yes, no, we've definitely talked about this before. We, we also talked about, we, we also talked about set, setting up a thing to circle back with you. And I know we started on that in the spring. 
I don't know where that is and I totally forgot all about it. So let me follow up and bring it back to you next time to see where we're at because we have talked about this and we did talk about following up. Okay, what actually did happen uh, with those? So uh, thank you for bringing I mean, I up. would be fine just seeing this spreadsheet with the acronyms on the side, like just what happened to it. I think we- yeah. For yeah. this set of items though, it says a professional electronics waste recycling company is picking up these materials. So how, whatever that means, they're recycling, I'm sure what they can salvage to recycle. Right, That's but- if it's being recycled, then it's all being disposed of. It, none of it is going to be donated. Well, then that's what we should say, that they're all going to be scrapped. So my it, understanding when I read this was it was clear it's all going to be scrapped. Okay. It says that in the cover letter. There's a few items that have a D next to them that, for donate that, that can be donated. But I always assume that anything that doesn't designate we've donated it is, is scrapped in the most environmentally conscious way we can. Right, and I know we do that. I think not just for this list, but for future lists, because there are things that we do that are costly, that we do say that we're gonna dispose of, that we've never really seen what has happened after. And I know I would like to see that. Correct, and we have clearly talked about that. We've clearly talked about bringing back a list. I completely have forgotten about this. So we'll, we'll bring this back uh, to you. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to item F, June 30th, bills payable. This is an informational uh, item for the board. Any? Yep, just that we have bills here and we're hoping that everything is done, but there are at times always something that comes in that we wanna make sure we get into fiscal year, uh, end of the fiscal year. And so we'll report that out in July. It's usually not a ton, not very substantial, but it's, um, yeah. So this is just a annual thing we do. Okay. Okay, uh, any final comments before we move on to future agenda items? There's a list here. Any additions, questions? Okay, uh, that adjourns F and F at 6.20. Wild. Hmm. It's definitely a record. I'm running them all. No, yeah. <laughs>Good evening, everyone. So nice to see a full house. We are celebrating a lot of student recognition tonight. So we're going to get the ball rolling. Um, going to review the agenda quickly. We're going to say the pledge, have roll call, and um, we have, uh, we're going to do the public hearing for our budget quickly. Um, then we will have student recognition and an invitation for public comment following student recognition. We've got a couple of FOIA requests to recognize, and we will have further good news from Dr. Herman. Uh, we do have a consent vote agenda tonight. These are items that are routinely approved in one motion. We discuss them extensively in committee. Um, at this time, are there any board members wishing to remove any of the items listed in the consent vote agenda to discuss separately? No. no. None. Seeing none, moving on to items for action. Uh, we will have an adoption of our fiscal year 24 budget. We will approve the ISB annual member dues. We will have a semi-annual review of our closed session minutes. We will uh, read a set of board policies for our second reading and vote for adoption. Uh, we will vote on a resolution authorizing commencement of social media litigation. We do have an intergovernmental agreement to discuss and vote on with the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services. We will vote on renewing the fiscal year 24 treasurer's bond, as well as our fiscal year 23 audit engagement. Uh, the last item to vote on will be our drapery cleaning and flame retardant application approval for the draperies at both buildings. In our for information section, we will have our superintendent's report, we will discuss any board comments and events. Uh, we will not have an IASB report. Do we have a report for CEDAL? Yes. We do. Um, any other reports uh, that board members might wish to discuss? Uh, we will review our future agenda items. We will retire to executive, executive session for the purpose of uh, discussing employment of an employee under uh, 5 ILCS 120 2C1 as well as discussing collective negotiating matters under 5 ILCS 120-2C2. Um, after that, um, we will be voting on a uh, resolution authorizing a notice to remedy 
and then we will adjourn. So if I could ask everybody to please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Jim Batson. Kara Benjamin. Here. Don Carmichael. Here. Kara Drumkey. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Sonal Kulkarni. Casey Rooney. Here. We note five members present. Um, and as we've already reviewed the agenda, we will call the public hearing for fiscal year 24 open. Do we have any public comment regarding the fiscal year 24 budget? If there's anybody wishing to address the board at this time, please. Maybe could I go through the presentation and then? So we're listed here. that there's before the presentation, we're supposed to ask for public comment on this portion. Oh, okay. So if uh, we have any members of the public wishing to address the board regarding the uh, fiscal year 24 budget, please go to the podium. Seeing none, going once, going twice, we will move on to the budget hearing presentation. All right, um, hopefully pretty brief here. Um, so what we're gonna do is walk through, go to the next one. Uh, we're gonna walk through just a reminder. So best I can give you context of fiscal year 24 is give you something to compare to, which is fiscal year 23. Remind you of that in our financial projections. I'll walk through a little bit of what is actually happening for fiscal year 23, and then I'll review um, our fiscal 24 budget, and then um, a note about fund balance and capital projects at the end. Uh, so we go forward a couple. So next, so uh, so FYI for everybody, our FY23 budget had a deficit of $1.9 million. Uh, but if you go to the next slide, um, we knew about this. Uh, this is primarily an effect of switching our revenue recognition uh, of fully deferring our fund balance or fully deferring our spring taxes. So we knew this was going to happen and we knew this was gonna be a one year thing. And so as you can see, our projections are assuming that this is gonna happen and it's, and it's gonna be over with. Uh, don't worry about fiscal 27 and 28 yet. Um, a lot of things can happen and that's based on a lot of assumptions that the second you make them, the assumptions change anyways. So that's just a frame of reference, $1.9 million deficit. So then fiscal year 23 actuals, just stay here for, go back, just stay there for a second. The fiscal year is not done yet. Even though there are four days, we have a lot of money still to spend in the next four days because we have our June 30th payroll to still run. And we have to recognize our revenues once, we, once the bank statements come in and we settle all of our revenues. So I don't really have really good information for you on our fiscal year 23, 23 actuals yet. However, now we'll go to the next one. There were two sources of revenue that the board should be well aware of at this point that we've informed a few times is two sources of revenue came in much higher than we anticipated. One is called CPPRT, that's personal property taxes. That's basically money we get from the Illinois Department of Revenue based on, mostly based on the income and taxed, taxed income from companies in Illinois. So if they have a lot of revenue and they have a lot of taxable taxable income, part of that tax comes to us through CPPRT. And so that was way higher than we all anticipated. Uh, so that, that's, that's up about 790,000 so far, more than what we budgeted. And then the interest income as well. Um, we knew rates were higher, didn't think they would stay this high this long, especially a year ago when we were estimating this. And so that also came in higher. So if you think that we are in a deficit of about 1.9, this is showing about 1.5 the other way. So I would say we're probably going to end up closer to, closer to flat, maybe a small surplus by the end of the fiscal year, but we won't know that till all the dust settles. So to just give you a frame of reference. Um, now if we go on, so here is uh, the operating budget for fiscal year 24. Um, so just real quick, a few major assumptions. There's a lot of numbers in this budget. There's, um, this is a hundred million dollar budget on expenditures and 100 million on revenue. So this $200 million budget really is what we're talking about. There's a lot of numbers here. But when you zoom out, as far as I can zoom out, the major things that are happening, the biggest thing on the revenue side is a 5% CPI. 
that's the interest or that's the uh, uh, essentially the rate of inflation that we're able to access for property taxes and the Libertyville TIF was recaptured. Um, that was the biggest impact and on the expenditure side. Our biggest impact are the people that we have. So that's the staffing plans that the board approved earlier this spring. That's the raises built in. Um, and then one thing to note that is significant, it's, it represents about a million dollars, is there was a one-time COLA 2% stipend payment to everybody. Uh, this year, that falls off for next year. So that's why um, that's, that, that's impacting the percentage change on the salary side. And the other major thing that we are we are facing is inflation. Inflation is here. We are facing it a lot. It is showing it is showing up in double digits in a lot of places. The best example I can give you is our medical insurance. Our PPO is up 17 and a half percent and our HMO is up 12 and 12.7 percent. And that's just one small taste. But those are big numbers um, that's doing that. So then if we go to the next slide, there's a lot of numbers here. But even that this is a summary still a very high level summary. Really three numbers to pay attention to. Next year, our operating budget has that bottom number, a, I would say a small surplus of 680,000. It's not quite as much as I would want. I'd love to see a million, but I think we're, I think we're gonna do pretty good uh, there. And then if you can see on the revenue side, 7% increase on the revenue, most of that is due to the property taxes. Um, and then the expenditure side is 4%. And that's where you'll see there's salary changes there, benefit changes, and then a host of things that are a, a lot impacted by inflation. Um, so that that's a really uh, quick look at our operating budget. Um, I still feel like it's a good budget. We're able to afford all the things that we talked about doing. And so we're able to do that. We go to the next one. Uh, just a quick note on fund balance and capital projects. So uh, last when we had talked, we even talked about this, um, I believe in May, uh, the estimated fund balance that would be available for capital projects that we talked about in the somewhere in the range of 13 to 14 uh, million dollars. Um, we identified the top three projects up based on our prioritization, which is the LHS cafeteria renovation, uh, renovation of bathrooms at LHS, and a reconfiguration of LST offices in Vernon Hills. And so uh, based on that, um, if you go to the next one, next slide, there we go. Um, what I've put in on the capital projects fund side is a $3 million estimate. So that is an estimate to cover really three things. Um, one is to finalize the transition pathways, which is a project that's hap happened really mostly this year, but we haven't totally closed out that project yet. We're still waiting for kind of a final legal thing to sign off on so that we can finally pay out the remaining like $20,000 or something left, but we can't, I can't do it until we get a final sign off. Uh, then we have the reserve uh, for life safety work that we had talked about, uh, the 10-year life safety work at Vernon Hills. It might be $100,000. $30,000 I think is realistic what we might end up doing. So it'll cover that work that we have to do and then a reserve for the start of these new projects. So actually tomorrow a team is starting to meet for the LHS cafeteria renovation. And so we're gonna, this year will, or you know, most of the next year will be about designing, especially in the fall and then bidding that out and getting everything ready. It'll start in the spring. So we'll incur some costs, but we're not gonna get the bulk of the cost until probably next year. So this is meant to cover additional costs for something that we don't actually know how much it's gonna cost yet, but I need to put a placeholder in there. And this doesn't affect our operating um, numbers at all. So that's an overview of our fiscal 24 budget. Great, do the board members have any questions? I will note for the public, we have been discussing this extensively since February. So we have been questioning, receiving updated reports, are receiving more information. So if the board members don't have any questions, that's the reason why. But now would be the time if you do. I think we've asked them all. <laughs> I, I know that we have. <laughs> okay. So um, just getting back to my place on the agenda. I will now declare the hearing closed. <laughs> <laughs> the good news about that is that we are now ready for our communication section and we can kick off our student recognition. Well, good evening. It's nice to see a big crowd here. Um, my name is Brian Kelly. I'm the associate superintendent. and. Um, Unfortunately, our, um, our principals, we kind of give them a little bit of time off in the summer, but I work closely with our athletic directors um, at both schools, John Woods and Brian McDonald. So I'm here to help uh, present a lot of uh, awards to our students uh, for this past year. And I know we have some coaches 
that'll also help me to present. Um, so as I call them up, I also want to recognize uh, there are students that couldn't be here today because of the, the summer. I do want to recognize their name um, if they're not here and just recognize them for their accomplishments. So we have a lot of great things. So I am going to start with um, Libertyville High School, and I would like to um, recognize and if you are here, come up for um, your presentation. I would like to recognize first for uh, girls softball, um, those recognized from the Illinois Coaches Association, uh, Adriana Callahan and Michaela Boone. And I know Michaela was not able to attend. Is Adriana? Um, for water polo, we have two water polo that uh, were recognized for all state. Um, our water polo teams um, had a nice uh, year at uh, Libertyville High School uh, and made it to the sectional finals. For girls water polo, um, Emily Fink, and for boys, Eric Sparks. And some other individuals uh, for boys, uh, Libertyville boys basketball, and they were uh, made it to the section. Uh, they were sectional champs, and um, one of their individuals was voted to the All-State team, Aiden Boone, and I know he um, couldn't be here either today. Uh, for girls basketball, and they were um, regional champions at Libertyville, and um, a couple players uh, recognized um, by the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association, Kate Rule, I know she couldn't be here with us, and Emily Fisher. Um, and Emily's going to play um, in Maryland next year, so congratulations to uh, both of them. We'd also like to thank our, uh, or um, recognize um, our cheerleaders that were voted to the Illinois High School Cheerleading Association, um, Coaches Association, all state at Libertyville High School. I know they were state qualifiers and finished um, ninth in the co-ed division, Nicole Smith and Christian Rittner, and they were unable to attend today. Let's um, recognize some of our Vernon Hills High School um, athletes. For um, basketball, uh, the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association, um, special mention, All-State, Milan Ravel. Mil Millen. Last name? Ravel. All right, can you go Okay. For girls basketball, I know Grace couldn't be here, but uh, for Vernon Hills High School, I'd like to recognize Grace Kepke. And for... Um, Honorable mention, All-State Boys Volleyball, um, David Rezepa. Rezepa. Next up, we'd like to recognize um, those cheerleaders from Vernon Hills High School. And again, they were state qualifiers and finished seventh in the uh, state in the medium division. And I know a couple of them are here with us today. Dylan Klein, Sarah, Kuz Sarah Kuzinski, and Riley Donaldson. Next up, we would write, like to recognize somebody from the fall, um, and she um, 
finished in eighth place for girls golf. And um, just a, a little history, um, she finished in uh, previously in fifth place um, in the state freshman year and 14th place or junior year and eighth place. Is that right? All right, Lexi Schulman, congratulations to girls golf. She's going to play with Central Michigan University next year, so we wish her well. Next up, we'd like to recognize um, some of our badminton players from Vernon Hills High School that were recognized by the Illinois Association of Badminton Coaches. So I'll call them uh, up here. Kaylee Bennett, um, All-State Team for Doubles, and Arushi Panda, All-State Team for Doubles. <laughs> Singles player, Nihal Kokarni. For the next uh, presentation of athletes, I'd like to introduce our head coach for boys track and field, Ross Caton. He thought he was going to get out of this, but uh, I'm going to have him. Um... Yeah. Is it okay to talk about them? Is yes, it okay, like, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> absolutely. So, all right. Yeah, the beginning. yeah. I've got your, I'll hold on to these. Okay. Can... Well, I, I, I kind of want to announce them um, to come on up uh first and be recognized and hope, hopefully they all brought their medals um to show off uh first i'd like to uh bring up maddox fluno <laughs> maddox along with uh, the other three gentlemen got fifth place uh, in the four by 400 meter dash uh last month at uh charleston at uh, eastern illinois at the state meet uh next i'd like to call up david casilla Uh, Charlie Blackmer. And then Jake Slavish. Um, so uh, I first want to talk about Jake because Jake not only uh, anchored the 4 by 400 meter uh, relay for us, uh, but he also was all state in the 300 intermediate hurdles as well. He placed seventh. Uh, in the hurdles, so he's making some noise there with his medals. Um, but I, I also just want to talk about Jake, Jake as well, because um, he actually has one more at home that he got last year with our four by 200 meter relay. Uh, and I think it just speaks to kind of the talent uh, and the commitment that Jake has had and, uh, and his contributions to the team and to the school and the program. Um, he is the only athlete in our program that has been uh, all state three times. We've had several guys, you know, once, twice, but he is the only one that has done it up until this point, three different times. Um, and it speaks to his commitment um, and how much we can depend on him because track is a very long season. We go January through through the end of May, pretty much all second semester. And it's a roller coaster ride. And as coaches, we, we, we try to have kind of predictions. How's the season gonna turn out? How are we gonna finish up at sectionals? Who's gonna go on to state? Who could possibly get all state? Um, and Jake was always there for us. I mean, Jake, you know, he, he works hard and we can depend on him, but he's had his own setbacks last year. Um, was it the second or third to last hurdle at sectionals last year? Um, he was in second place, top two go to state. Uh, Odin got a little off, hit the hurdle, fell, uh, didn't qualify. Um, luckily, he still got down, got all state in our four by two. Um, but that was something, you know, you know, everything can go as planned and then one little thing can, 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 you know, change, change those plans quickly. Um, and Jake, we knew he had the ability to get to, to be back in that position. Um, so like I said, it's a roller coaster ride. Um, the week, less than a week before sectionals at our conference meet, um, Jake, Jake's in first place, 300 hurdles. 
And the guy next to him, his arm goes wide, kind of knocks Jake a little bit, gets his footing off a little bit. He tries to stretch out to keep his to keep his steps between hurdles. And he was just a bit short, hit the hurdle, landed hard, scraped some skin, bruised his heel. Um, and as as a coach, you know, coach is, um, we we always go to the worst case scenario. Like we know Jake's tough and everything, you know, the bruised heel, but uh, last year sectionals is less than a week. He's running at sectionals. He's got to qualify. Is he going to do it? And I don't know if Jake ever worried about it at all, but it certainly didn't seem like it. Um, he qualified the next week at sectionals. And then um, the next week at state, um, ran a personal best, broke the school record uh, in prelims to make it to finals, and then finished seventh overall in the state um, on the biggest stage. Um, because track, you go to a high school track meet, some of you have been, it's in a football stadium, but those stands are built for football games, not for track meets. Um, so there's, there, there's very few in the stands, and, and the voices you hear are those crazy parents whose kids are running at that moment. We got some of those parents over here right now. <laughs> um, and so when you get to the state meet, you're now looking at a packed Division I football stadium all looking down on you. Um, it's bigger than anything you've been at all year long. And so I now want to talk about these four in the context of the 4 by 400 meter relay and what they did at state. But even before that, we talk about expectations. We had no expectations that a 4x4 relay was going to qualify for state, let alone get all state at the beginning of the season. We were more focused on different relays because these four guys, well, Jake, I've talked about Jake. Um, Charlie, though, all I knew about Charlie was pretty much his hairline from remote learning freshman year in AP Human Geography. Um, he was a volleyball kid. Uh, I knew he had a great cross country season last year. And I know his teammates who do track were on him about coming out for track. So when swimming season ended, Charlie decided to come out. That wasn't something we were necessarily counting on. And that changed things for us. Um, Maddox, four-year guy, but Maddox used to be a little shorter freshman year. Um, and we had discussions about Maddox like senior year. Maybe he can be a backup on the four by two if somebody goes down. We're not really sure. <laughs> and the development that he's done, and yeah, sure, he grew a bit, but he also works his tail off day in, day out in practice. Um, and what he was able to do and step up, what we were expecting, you know, was far beyond. Um, and then David, David's on track for four years, but this was David's first full season. COVID cut into his freshman year. COVID, then IHSA's scheduling overlapping with football, cut into his sophomore year. Last year, caught with a broken collarbone, missed the first half of the season. We knew David was fast. We just didn't know how fast he could be if he was healthy for a whole season. And so we didn't see this relay come together until less than a month before state. They ran together for the first time. And their first time together, they broke our school record. And they ran a state qualifying time. The next time they were all back together was at sectionals. They ran state qualifying again, but they didn't run as fast as they did two weeks prior. Now, I, I'm a throws coach. I can't take much credit for these guys at all, but rather credit goes to those three gentlemen. Raise your hand. Um, um, <laughs> but I, I was worried because when we ran our, 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 our school record, we were fifth best in the state. By the time we qualified for state, we were now 18th best because all these other teams were running all these faster times. And I talked about the pressure that that state meet brings. And kids can rise and kids can fall with that pressure. Jake rose for that pressure. We saw him do it last year in the 4x2. He did it again in the 300s. Now, the tough part is about a relay is you not only need one kid to rise, you need all four. You got to make sure those handoffs are clean, those exchange zones don't get too crowded and knock somebody over. And all four of these guys stepped up and in prelims, they knocked two and a half seconds off their previous best time, their old school record, to make it to finals. And then the very next day, they broke that school record again. And they stepped up when it mattered most. And that speaks to their drive, their, their, their focus. The effort they put into it for the last five months, or for some, the last four years. Um, and it also speaks to the quality of our coaches and the support we get from our parents. Uh, and it was something that I just love being a part of, and I want it to happen every single year. So um, congratulations, gentlemen. You guys deserve it. Dylan's team. He's playing banana rules. Savannah banana rules. He just called the center field on FaceTime. 
It's, I mean, when you say things, then you're like, it's something important. It's banana rolls. <laughs> and last, we'd like to introduce uh, Jan Pauly, our um, head softball coach. Hello. Thank you all for coming. So we had a great season this year. We won our regional. We won uh, our CSL um, again for seven years in a row. I do believe it was six, six years in a row. So um, our three student athletes here tonight were just fantastic for us on the field and off the field. Um, the first uh, student athlete that we should recognize is Emma O'Flaherty. She's not here tonight, but she was nominated for third team all states. So Emma, congratulations. Um, girls, come on up. We have three of our student athletes here tonight. Senior, Amanda Tushke. Junior, Morgan Hart. And sophomore, Kate Pangilinan. And, and I'll just be brief. I'll say just a few words about these girls. So um, Amanda, as a junior last year, she was third team all state. And then this year, she is second team all state. Amanda brings a lot of energy to our team and our dugout. And she was our spark plug this year for sure. And we are very proud of her accomplishments for the two seasons that she started in our infield. She had battled an injury all of sophomore year and she missed freshman year for COVID. So she's really just a two year varsity athlete um, with experience playing. And she had a fantastic career here and we're super proud of her. We wish her all the best as she continues on her softball career at the University of St. Mary in Minnesota. Morgan Hart, she is a, was a junior this year. She was a three-year varsity player. She pitched a lot this season because we had some injuries, so she stepped up and filled a need that our team um, desperately needed her to do. And Morgan hit 402 this season, and she was named to the third team All State. Morgan is a leader in our dugout, and she is just a fantastic kid to coach. We look forward to next season as she will lead us. And um, we really enjoyed coaching her this year, and she was a great teammate, and um, we are super proud of her development. And congratulations, Morgan. Kate, Kate um, is a, was just a sophomore this year. She is a fantastic athlete, and she um, played had a great year. She played mostly second base for us this season. She hit 430, and um, is just a really hard worker. She's kind of a quiet kid, doesn't um, say a whole lot, but she works really hard. And we are really super um, proud of her development and her um, her contribution this season as a sophomore coming in to play varsity for the first time. So she had a great season. She was named a second team all state. She hit 430 and um, just a fantastic kid to coach. Congratulations. Thank you. Our last recognition tonight, we'd like to recognize our team from Libertyville High School girls soccer. If any girls soccer players, if they would come up here at this time. No, there's a lot that couldn't make it. Um, so I'd like to recognize them for their third place um, in the IHSA. Um, they beat, defeated uh, Glenbrook South um, in the regionals um, to advance to the sectionals where they defeated Frem 2-0. And then super sectionals, they defeated uh, Nutria one nothing. And then at the state finals, they did run into a tough Barrington team, lost to Barrington in the semifinals. 
Um, and if anyone knows, when you go to state and there's only four teams and you lose that first one, it's really hard to come back. But they did a nice job um, coming back in the third, fourth place game and finished in third uh, place, defeating Lincoln Way East uh, by a score of two to one. So congratulations to the uh, Libertyville girls soccer team on their third place finish. And that concludes all of our recognitions. Um, I appreciate um, all the parents coming out uh, today. Um, but also all the dedication that you have throughout the seasons. And it's not just the seasons, but it's the off seasons, it's the driving, it's the, um, you know, sitting in a track meet when it's probably raining and cold, going to a golf match when nobody else is there watching, you know, except maybe uh, parents um, and going to gyms to watch badminton and basketball um, and all that stuff. So, um, you know, athletes, if you get a chance, make sure you thank your parents for coming or your grandparents uh, for attending throughout the year. Um, you know, without your family and support, um, you probably wouldn't be here with some of the achievements uh, that you have. So make sure you thank them. And I'd like to congratulate all of our athletes on their wonderful accomplishments this year. Thank you. And you are free to go unless you want to sit around for the rest of the meeting, but you are welcome to stay. Mass exit. Yeah. Stay to the rest of the meeting. Okay, I guess we're done here. Yep. <laughs> And it's back to quiet. <laughs> yes. Well, we are going to move right along in the interest of getting to uh, public comment. We do have one person that signed in. I'd like to ask Katie Tolerico to uh, come to the podium. Oh, Tolerico, my apologies. Hi, everybody. Um, as you probably know, uh, my name is Katie Tolerico. Um, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Impressive athletic accomplishments. Um, but I just want to talk a bit tonight about academics. Um, I'm a pediatrician, so academics are really important to me. Um, I really value education, went through a lot of years of schooling. Um, I also have three kids, one who is a bit younger, uh, but one who will be a junior at LHS, um, and one who graduated from LHS last year. And I've really noticed quite a bit of a difference in the academic experience from now till back in 2018. Um, some of the things that are concerning to me are the lack of homework. Um, maybe not lack of homework, but sometimes there are assignments given and they won't be given points if they're turned in. So this discourages some kids from doing them. Um, Homework is good for our kids. It helps them learn when a teacher presents material in class. If it's not revisited that night, it might exit the kid's brain pretty quickly and it'll be more difficult for them to do well on their test. Um, I, I think homework's really important and I think to not give a point value to it, um, it you know, it, it's kind of assuming all kids are intrinsically motivated and they're just gonna do the homework because they know it's gonna help their learning. But the majority of kids aren't really intrinsically motivated yet. And especially this group of kids who suffered with COVID, they missed out on their middle school years when a lot of that sort of intrinsic motivation would have been uh, helped along. Um, I'm also seeing just a lack of accountability. You know, there's not really deadlines. If there are assignments given, the assignments can be turned in up until the end of the semester. Um, so again, this isn't teaching our kids those time management skills that they need to do well in school. Um, and it's not helping them learn the material. If there's an assignment given, it needs to be done when it's due so that that, will, that material will be further ingrained in their brain and it'll help them do well on their test. And when they take their test, I know that they now have the opportunity to do test retakes. Um, and I get how, in theory, this could seem like a great idea give kids a chance to do better on the test if they didn't fully master the concepts. But I don't see how this can work when there's so much material to get through in a semester. A unit, unit one quite often, if it's not mastered, will affect learning unit two because the concepts in learning unit unit two have to be learned from the concepts mastered in unit one. So I think what happens is a lot of these kids 
you know, maybe don't study very much for their test the first time around because they know they can retake it. So they're not really mastering those concepts. And then they're trying to play catch up all semester long with trying to go back and do a retake that sometimes they have a whole month to, to get to do again. Um, and it's also just not really preparing them for life after high school. Colleges don't give test retakes in life. Many times you don't get to do retakes. So um, these things just bother me and, and I think they probably come from a good place I think there's probably a concern for our kids mental health and this is where it's coming from right you know we have to um give kids a little more grace and um you know I'm sorry that that's three better. minutes so we'd like you to um finish your thought and if yeah you wrap up. I, I just want to mention that it's backfiring because this isn't helping their mental health when they're going off to college they're not prepared and they're a lot are struggling and instead of being home with their family and friends and their community that supported them through many years to help them they're they're alone i think that um there's an ap concept that uh, ap psychology concept that district 128 teaches that's really important and it talks about how important stress is to learning there is a minimal stress level that's needed to learn and i think you guys are you know in in trying so hard to help kids mental health you're under stressing many of them to the point where they're getting bored, they're not achieving, they're getting depressed. So I think in trying to help their mental health, you're essentially hurting it. Um, I got a mailer recently about proficiency I'm sorry, you're, you're way over the three minute limit. Okay. So if you could please wrap it up. About the mailer I got about proficiency scores being 60% for ELA and math. Um, that is very concerning to me. That is why I'm here. What is the plan to change that? I think that's not very good. Um, I don't know what proficiency means. Is it 50th percentile? So but you did give us your email and someone from the district office will I gave you what, I'm sorry? Your email? No, I didn't. You, your email address oh, is, I you, I is, you, is on- Email that I emailed. No, no, you, there's an email address on here. Right. And someone from the administration can follow up with you about those concerns. Thank you. Do we have anybody else wishing to address the board tonight? Okay, seeing none, we are going to move right along. Um, we do have some FOIA requests that came in. Yes, we received two FOIA requests this month and they both were filled and they are in your packet. Do you want to take that for the email? Mm -hmm. Great. And then another favorite part of ours, we can move on to good news. Wonderful. And again, building off of that in-person celebration we had, we have more students and staff to recognize. Uh, the District 128 Special Olympics earned several honors at the Special Olympics State Summer Games held earlier this month in Bloomington Normal. The Storm athletes brought home the following honors. Soccer team won bronze. Uh, team members were Chris Morozin, Chase Miller, Joseph Mahler, Charles Sampson, Hayden Johns, Libby Karsten, Albina Giza, Danielle Granados, Xavier Granados, and Hazel Morales. Um, Bocci, um, Luke Bardwell won a silver. And in track 200 meter race, the silver went to Mackenzie Runke and Ben Peterson won the bronze. Next in fine arts, a mixed media drawing and writing um, uh, piece by uh, Vernon Hills senior Val Bykova was selected for the 21 minus what was what is exhibit held earlier this month at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Designed by Chicago youth and curated and hosted by the MCA's teen creativity agency 21 minus is the MCA's annual exposition of youth and creativity. The Libertyville High School eSports CSGO team finished fourth in the High School eSports League National Championship on May 21st. Approximately 400 teams from across the country competed during the season with the top 16 making the national playoffs. This is the fourth semester in a row the team has made the playoffs, but its first top four finish. Team members are Eric Vu, Kyle Lee, Cameron Huang, John Murphy, Aiden Merchant, Chase Running, Abraham Quinones, and Nick Olson. The team is coached by Mark Busing. 
Next, all Physics 1 and 2 and AP Physics C students take the American Association of Physics Teachers Physics Bowl test in April. LHS competes in a regional consisting of schools from Illinois, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Nebraska. Worldwide, about 6,300 students took the Division I test, and about 3,200 students took the Division II test. This year, the first, this year, LHS first year AP physics students competing in Division I placed third in the region, and the second year students competing in Division II placed first in the region. In Division II, senior Omad Mahoud received the second highest individual score in the region. The five students who contributed to the school store school score were Division I, Ed Stewart, Will Bain, Will Carney, Seif Kotub, and Braden Bradford. In Division II, Ahmad Bamoud, Oliver Scanio, Ahmed Mostafa, Belinda Lee, and Aditya Chakara. And that is the end of our good news for June. Thank you. It is always so nice. We have. Oh, I take that back. Oh. Hot off the presses. Oh, yeah. I have One two additions. Two additions, actually. Um, we are graced in our presence here to have a new <laughs> executive board member for Ed Red, which stands for Education Research and Development, and it is a consortium of um, suburban school districts who pool their resources to try and have an influence on policy and other improvement goals and actions in the state of Illinois. And our very own Lisa Hessel is going to be serving on a two year term um, for the Ed Red Board, and we uh, appreciate her taking on that additional duty. Thank you. And then lastly, um, again, I think anytime we take on a big effort like this, it's wonderful to recognize the team who participated. Um, I received a thank you note from the IHSA um, thanking the Vernon Hills team for hosting the 2023 IHSA Boys Tennis State Finals. The tournament is an incredibly large undertaking with 384 athletes participating and nearly 500 matches being played over the course of three days. Um, our district's contribution to the tournament are greatly appreciated, so please share our gratitude with your building administrators, athletic department, and building grounds department for their efforts in running the tournament. So we are very proud of our Vernon Hills team and making sure that we shined very strongly among all the state tennis teams who visited our campus. Now we are done with good news. Uh, thank you to the Vernon Hills High School tennis team for hosting, and uh, thank you, Dr. Herman, for um, the spotlight on our many talented students. It is always so impressive to see how many talents, talented students we have in uh, activities, fine arts, as well as athletics. So uh, we are going to move on to our uh, consent vote agenda. Um, we are looking for a motion to approve the consent vote agenda as listed. Benjamin, I move to approve the consent vote agenda as listed. Rooney, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. The motion passes. Uh, the consent vote agenda is approved. Moving on to individual items for action. Uh, first, we have the adoption of our fiscal year 24 budget. Um, this is uh, in relation to the hearing that we just held. Um, I don't believe there's any further explanation necessary unless you would like to give it some context. Just that we're here, this is the soonest that I think we've ever adopted a budget, so mm. that's exciting. Thank you, and congratulations to you and your team for moving up this timeline. We appreciate it. It helps us make better decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so we are looking for a motion to adopt the fiscal year 24 budget. Carmichael, so moved. Trumkey, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Trumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Motion passes. Moving. A reminder, we need every all of you to sign. The oh, that's right. Uh, before you leave. Sure. So, yeah. thank you. Great. Thank you for the reminder. 
Moving on to the fiscal year 2024 Illinois Association of School Board IASB member dues. Um, as we discussed, um, this is an important uh, association that we are a member of that serves all school boards in the state of Illinois. We are looking for a motion uh, to uh, approve the fiscal year 2024 ISB member dues. Rooney, motion to approve the fiscal year 2024 IASB member dues in the dollar amount of $10,727. Thank you. Do I have a second? John Key, second. <laughs> Thank you. Any discussion? Were you waiting? No, Dan and I were having. Seeing none, roll call, please. Drum key. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. And motion passes. Next on the agenda, um, the semi annual review of closed session minutes. You're looking for a motion that confirms the need for confidentiality still exists for all current closed session minutes and those listed below and all shall remain in the closed file. Drumkey, uh, move to motion that the need for confidentiality still exists for all current closed session minutes and those listed below and all shall remain in the closed file. Benjamin, second. Thank you, any discussion? Seeing none, roll call please. Hessel. Aye. Uh, Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. I just want to comment on the wonderful job that Carol Skoden does taking our mm -hmm. notes during our closed session. Yes, I would say that um, getting a chance to review them always lets yeah. us reflect on how good you are at your job. So thank you, Carol, and thank you, Dr. Herman, for pointing that out for us. Um, the motion passes, and we are moving on to um, uh, approve and adopt the 12 updated board policies as presented. Looking for a motion to approve Carmichael, those. so moved. Rooney, second. Um, any discussion? We did just come yeah. out of committee and discuss them. Say, if it seems like we're flying through this, we right. just got out of committee and now yeah. we're here. So and correct. they were discussed we're moving along. Last month. Yes. 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 This yes. is the I'm second. Not sure, review. how much more we could. I I don't <laughs> think we could discuss them anymore. But now would be the time <laughs> since we have a motion in a second. If anyone would like to discuss it further, seeing none, roll call, please. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Motion passes. Moving on, uh, we are going to look for a motion to approve the resolution authorizing the commencement of social media litigation. Um, I would like to give some background on this um, as listed in the packet. In the recent years, the proliferation of widespread access to and use of social media among public school students has expanded dramatically leading to significant risks of anxiety, depression, thoughts of self-harm, and suicidal ideation among our students. This widespread adoption, consumption, and use of social media has caused the district to incur costs in the form of staff time, disciplinary proceedings, emotional and social counseling, medical services, and other costs with the expectation that these costs will only increase unless and until student use of social media is reduced or the social media platforms reform their practices in attracting students. The district has determined that it is necessary, advantageous, desirable, and in the public interest and the best interests of the students of the district that it participates in this litigation by filing a lawsuit seeking monetary and non-monetary damages against the above referenced social media companies and other parties responsible for the harm caused by social media platforms. Um, I think everybody has had a chance to uh, review uh, the recommendations from our attorneys um, this litigation will not cost the district anything other than a bit of time on the part of our administrators. Um, if there is a monetary settlement that the district realizes, we will give 20% as a fee um, to the legal team uh, in California that has organized this. It is the same legal team that successfully sued Jewel. So um, unless uh, we and that's have- That's J-U-U-L. That is correct. Right. That is correct. Not the not the grocery. Not the, the first fine time you grocery. said it, I was like, "What did they?" Do? I know <laughs> they, they not to be confused with the <laughs> fine and upstanding like, Chicago Land like, grocery retailer <laughs> Jewel. Uh, the Jewel. the uh, lawsuit was successful as a national uh, federal suit against Jewel, the vape manufacturer. This is the same firm 
uh, bringing this suit. Um, it is something we discussed in committee, uh, but if we could have a motion and a second, we could discuss any further thoughts or concerns. Can I just um, point out, I believe you said 20% and it says 25 here. I did mean to say 25%. Okay, that just it, wanted to clarify for the public. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. yes, I misspoke. It is 25% of any settlement. Move to approve the resolution authorizing commencement of social media litigation, and that was Carmichael. Mm -hmm. Rooney, second. Thank you. Um, for further discussion, I would like to note that it is not just monetary damages that this suit, se suit seeks. Although that is important, it is even more important that these social media firms are forced to reform their practices. Mm -hmm. They are in the business of addiction. They are willfully harming our children, and they do not do the necessary age checks. In order to sign up for a gas rewards card, you have to verify your age and identity. There's no reason that they can, the social media companies can't verify the age of people who are signing up. Furthermore, they need to be forced to cooperate with school districts and local law enforcement when there mm -hmm. is a threat. Mm -hmm. uh, they refuse to disclose locations um, or to take down harmful content. So um, just as important, I just wanted to to point that out, um, one of the motivators for bringing this suit in the first place. Any other discussion? I just had a question. If we um, do know how many other districts are party to the suit as of yet? It's, it was mentioned. Yeah, there's uh, about three, excuse me, about 300, 325 at the time that we received right. this information that had already signed up. Okay. And uh, over the next month or two, I think we'll have that a lot That number's of expected to grow. Yes. Yeah. That okay. number is expected to grow. And speaking with other superintendents in the North Suburban uh, Superintendents Group. Several of them were pl planning to take it in June or July to their boards for approval also. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Okay, roll call please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Motion passes. I think it's something we're gonna be proud to take a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, moving on. Next on the agenda is the District 128 Intergovernmental Agreement with the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services. If we could have someone just summarize what this IGA will, will do. I know uh, Kelly is not here. Um, this uh, was prepared by Kelly Hartwig, our Director of Special Services. Um, Dr. E.B., do, do you want to summarize for us? Yes. Thank you. So good. Good evening, everyone. Um, so just to, again, summarize, um, right now, the Illinois Department of Healthcare, Family and Services um, are now requiring or require each local um, education agency to enter into an IGA um, with the state's Medicaid administrative outreach vendor. Um, and we have to, and it requires us to do this IGA by June the 30th. Um, basically, um, beforehand, um, we um, school districts throughout the state of Illinois received um, Medicaid and Medicaid administrative outreach um, funding for students um, that normally or could also receive what we would consider hospital services such as speech and language, um, uh, psychological services. Um, IEP meetings and IEP mean, minutes are included into that um, for students with special needs. However, due to um, the significant needs of our students, especially those that receive Medicaid, they have expanded these services. And so um, now throughout the district, we are looking at um, doing an inter, intergovernmental agreement so that we can provide services to all of our Medicaid su students, those who have uh, services, as well as those who do not. Great. So my understanding is generally that this will allow us to recoup some additional um, expenses that we are outlaying yes. on behalf of our students. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, looking for a motion to approve the District 128 IG with the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services. Rooney, so moved. Drumkey, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. Uh, now we are going to discuss a motion to approve the fiscal year 24 treasurer's bond. 
in the amount of eighteen thousand uh, dollars. The the fee for the bond is eighteen thousand dollars. The amount of the bond is thirty million. Uh, we did discuss this extensively in committee tonight as well. So, uh, looking for a motion, please. Drumkey, move to approve the fiscal year twenty four treasurer's bond in the amount of eighteen thousand dollars. Rooney, second. Thank you. Any discussion? We will wait for roll call for I think I'm first. Don to come back. Oh. I think I'm first. Mm -hmm. It's taking long for this one. Yeah. I think it's worth re reminding. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> now I can think. He's ready. <laughs> Thank you. Roll call, please. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Just. My motion passes. Moving on, um, we are going to look for a motion to approve the fiscal year 23 audit engagement with Miller Cooper. Um, we also discussed this in committee. Um, these are the audit services for our finances. Uh, it will, the agreement will facilitate the fiscal year 2023 audit, which is required by state and federal law. Uh, looking for a motion to approve. Rooney, motion to approve the fiscal year 2023 audit engagement with Miller Cooper in the amount of $56,700. Benjamin, second. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, roll call, please. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Motion passes. Moving on, uh, the contracts for drapery cleaning and flame retardant application uh, for both Libertyville High School and Vernon Hills High School. Um, these are contracts that will take care of cleaning and fireproofing uh, the draperies at both buildings. Uh, we are looking for a motion to approve a contract in the amount of $40,176, uh, $40,176.28 for Libertyville High School and $48,026.75 for Vernon Hills High School. Benjamin, so moved. Drumkey second. Thank you. Any discussion? Just one clarification. It doesn't fireproof them. It's fire retardant. retardant. Fire, thank you. It slows them down. Thank you. Good clarification. Um, seeing no discussion, roll call, please. Rooney. Aye. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Motion passes. We move on to items for information, and we'll turn it over to Dr. Herman for a superintendent's report. Sure, if we could call up, I just put a few slides together just to give some visuals. Um, two main things that I would like to update the board on tonight. Um, and it's going to be presented in just a minute. So as we have been working diligently on the strategic plan, setting the goals and the action plans, and now working on the implementation timeline and staff training, we are working diligently to try and create one main hub for this information. Yeah. Um, we have been working and, you know, as different questions have been asked among the board, we've created some different tools to monitor that, but they're separate tools. They're separate spreadsheets. Um, so I just wanted to remind the board that we do have, uh, if you could click on, click on the goals. So we have all of our goals and they are linked on our action plan, or they're linked on our website. They were also sent to all residents as a hard copy. So we have done a very good job communicating what our three goal areas are and the major initiatives that are associated with each one of those. We'll continue to have those available, but we still, um, you'll see here that although it has a summary of the action plans further down, it doesn't necessarily have the time frame for each one of those. That would be difficult to necessarily capture on a one page summary like we have here on the, on the website. Well, if you could go back to the second document. So we also have our action plan summaries and that again was developed by teams of administrators and teachers who work together to say, if this is our goal, here's the actions that we need to take and they're spread out over five years trying to make sure we're pacing ourselves. But we're also trying to make sure that we can see all of this because these were developed by teachers who are very passionate and administrators who are very passionate and they are detailed action plans. Um, so a lot of this is for the committee work 
not necessarily all of the work that will be done or perceived exterior. Not all of this is going to impact all staff. Not all of this will impact all students. Um, so we want to uh, honor this work that's driving individual committees, but continue to find ways to sort of progress monitor to this. Where are we with the, each committee? Uh, Bo, if you could go back to the next. We also put together as a DLT team something that we called our change map. Of all of those things that were listed in the action plan, what are those actions that really are going to impact either staff practice or student practice? It's not just committee work of researching or developing something. It's when something will be developed, something will be changed. And so those would be some things that we want to showcase and make sure that people are aware of sort of coming soon kind of things and making sure that students, staff, parents understand the sequence at which things will be rolled out. And again, then understanding some of the professional learning that's going to be needed prior to some of these implementations. If you could go back to the key, we also um, want to keep track of the members. Um, this is uh, a copy of last year's member. If we have our three um, strategic plan area teams, and then we also have our grading and assessment team, which is a, a committee that's continued for a few years through a COVID. Um, and then we also have our use of time team. So each year we um, see which administrators, which teachers, other people want to uh, participate on these teams, making sure that all staff know who is representing them on these committees, what their meeting schedule is going to be. So we'll be, again, updating this for this year's committee action team um, so everyone knows um, who's, who's representing them. The next document is uh, our professional learning map. And this is one that um, we put together, right now this is in draft form, because we put together the whole roadmap for the five years, but then annually we take a deeper dive to say, now how are we going to use our four in-service days? So you'll see that we have the, the day um, when we all come back and really fo focusing on positive culture and climate, um, the communication plan that we're gonna kick off, some new attendance procedures, and then the afternoon, there'll be some support and learning for teachers, for grading and assessment, for student services staff, for the insight tool and MTSS progress monitoring. And then the whole second day is dedicated for teachers to do the work they need individually and in their PLCs to prepare for school. You'll scroll down, you see then we have one day in October um, that we have some learning targets and topics for, but that we'll be working with our instructional coaches to manage some of the individual sessions. And then we have one other in-service day um, that we'll be planning in February. Um, but we have more learning that needs to take place than what we can fit on what really is three, two, two, two real opportunities for professional learning. The other two days are very much dedicated with building prep, which is what you need as a professional to get ready to serve our students. So we are also trying to map out additional time that could be our Wednesday morning um, teacher uh, work time. Teachers have the PLC ones for their agenda, but we do have admin and building ones that we could um, deliver some professional learning and provide some support there. We're also looking at um, uh, an increase in the number of D128 university classes that would be aligned to our strategic plan and professional learning, as well as looking at things that are in smaller groups that aren't necessarily for across the whole district, having those be opportunities for small groups to um, have days away with subs. Again, not ideal, but when it's not the whole staff, those are the ones that we would rather um, spend the money on uh, providing subs. Um, so we're mapping all of that out. Um, and again, as administrators over the summer, doing from input that we received, but then working with our instructional coaches and department chairs and others to do all the fine tuning for each session. And then the last link um, was making sure that we are not just doing good work internally, but this document reminded us that many of the goal areas that we selected in work that we're doing is also aligned with changes that are required for ISBE. So we're trying to make sure that we say, here's our goals. And if you <laughs> scroll down, Bull, you'll see that we have our three goals, the actions that were taken, and then scroll down. 
links to all of the state mandates that we will be fulfilling as we are uh, achieving each of these particular phases of implementation. So we have been doing a lot of work to try and manage the heavy lift that this work is, but Mary and I will be working with one of our new um, uh, technology support uh, groups to figure out how can we organize and communicate this in one place on our website. So staff who want to know, let, I want to see the minutes from the um, health and well-being minutes, or I want to see who's on that committee, we will have one place for parents, for the board members, for staff to be able to go um, to find any of this information for the big picture view, as well as those who are really interested and want to take a deep dive. Um, so Mary and I um, will be working with our team, and also this came up in our um, the, the audit um, data that we will we'll be presenting to you in July. So we feel like we should have a, a model that's taking shape enough to share with you in July and potentially get feedback from the board members, and then it will be ready to roll out with all staff in August. So um, just wanted to give you a really good update on that. So we, we have a lot of the pieces of the puzzle and we have a lot of the data already gathered on the last stage we'll be putting it together. And I really look forward to working with Mary to make that happen. The second thing that I wanted to give an update on, um, and that is, um, I know we um, asked for data to be gathered from parents that would inform board's future action on criteria for making um, the uh, school calendar decisions. And so we were able to get the questions that the uh, board members helped us refine, um, and they went live on June 5th. And so as parents are completing all of their registration questions, updating of information and payment of fees, one of the steps in the seven step process is completing the inventory to give us their preferences on school calendar. Um, so that closes June 29th. So that will give us time in July to analyze that data and then share it with you in July. Again, get any direction from you so that we know how that data could be informing the criteria. Um, and then I assume if, if there's anything else the board needs, we would gather that information for you. Um, but that decision could be made as early as July or August in terms of how you guys see moving forward. So those are my two updates. Any questions? Uh, first of all, the uh, effort to come up with a, a, the map is a very important and ambitious project, but um, I think it will be uh, really incredibly helpful mm -hmm. um, for all of our stakeholders as we move forward mm -hmm. with the important work that we're doing. So thank you uh, for doing that. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Okay, next on the agenda, um, any board comments or events that have taken place that you'd like to share? I had the opportunity to ride in the Libertyville Days Parade ah. with uh, Congressman Schneider. Fun. Nice. Well, which, <clears throat> Congressman Schneider was not the most notable person. Yeah, my, my spotlight did get stolen by my seven-year-old granddaughter, uh -huh. who was living her best life, <laughs> yeah. chatting with the congressman, waving her flag, mm -hmm. having a ball. But it, it was really nice to see, you know, all the community come out. And we were sandwiched in between the band and the LHS band and the LHS Palms, which was so fun. Mm -hmm. So it just it was, a nice, it was a nice day. <laughs> Thank you for representing us. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as Ed Red goes, I'm excited to be involved. Um, I think that our district will have some uh, good contributions to be able to make to the legislative agenda to support quality public education. I will note that Ed Red is sponsoring a legislative breakfast, similar to the one that IASB did that we hosted at Libertyville High School. This one um, is in Wheeling mm -hmm. on August 6th at 8.30 in the morning. So if you would like to join us, um, Carol very kindly forwarded uh, the email invitation and is willing to RSVP for our group, and I would love to have our district be well represented. As far as the foundation board goes, um, I want to be sure that I thank publicly the outgoing uh, director, um, our chairperson, Nancy Beaumont, who has served on the foundation for many years uh, in several roles, um, is moving on, and a new um, 
chairperson will be named at the foundation board meeting in August. Uh, but we really want to thank Nancy. Um, just as a refresher, the foundation provides innovation grants to teachers in the district as well as funds a student in need fund uh, for students that have any needs outside of what the district provides. Um, so it's a really uh, wonderful organization that supports the district, and we thank Nancy for her years of service. Quick correction. Yes. The Ed Red Breakfast is August 3rd, the Thank Thursday. You. Yeah. I said the 6th. Thank you. I know. I was I'm like, doing good with my the numbers. 6th is a Sunday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay. Any other comments or events from board members? Um, we do not have an IASB report this evening, nor a CDL report. No, we do. Oh, we do have a oh I'm sorry. Reports. We did have a CDL report. That's my okay. Goodness. Sorry. Uh, there was a CEDAW governing board meeting on June 7th that I was able to attend up in Gages Lake, and um, there are a few things of mention. We appointed some new executive board members, uh, including the appointment of our new uh, fiscal year 23 to 24 treasurer. Uh, we approved our calendar for the governing board for the next year, so... Um, I have those all scheduled and ready to attend. Uh, we reached a three-year collective bargaining agreement with our CEDAL Support Staff Association. Um, and so uh, that is set to begin, I think, at the start of the school year. Uh, and then we had a presentation, like we did here, of our tentative budget and then went on to approve our uh, budget. And highlights of the CDAL budget include a 5% tuition rate increase to member districts. So that directly affects us. Mm -hmm. um, and that's 1% more than last year. And, and here's why, in case anyone is curious. Um, like us, we spend most of our money on our staff, which is a good place to put it. But there were staff salary and benefit uh, cost increases. Um, some of our contracted services uh, that we contract out uh, went up in cost. Um, we had to this year um, offer some recruitment stipends. Um, so there are some positions within CDAL that are just really difficult to fill at times. And so this is almost like a, a sign on bonus. Um, so that was, you know, a, a costly thing that we had to do. Um, additionally, we had to fund referral incentives. So staff uh, could refer uh, a current staff could refer people that they knew, and if someone was hired, a, a referral uh, incentive was paid. Um, we are using paraprofessionals as student teachers. So um, CEDAL is actually looking to certify its paraprofessionals into certified staff. So that's that costs a little more money to do that. Um, and then we it says increased supports to programs and member districts so um, i think there's just been a broadening of what we can offer to member districts in terms of services and programs available uh, interestingly though both enrollment and staffing are down um, but there is a five percent rate increase in operations and maintenance and i think this just follows along those lines of inflation affecting everything um, Additionally, something that really kind of uh, came up, well, just kind of, I think, was higher than maybe ever before, um, our contract services increased 17.8%. So that's a noteworthy number. So um, to kind of sum up, uh, just like everything else in the world, CDAL also, you know, has a budget that um, is ever increasing and, and the costs are uh, you know, continue to be of concern that we need to, uh, you know, we need to fulfill our duties every year and it, it just continues to get more costly. So I think we, re we see that reflected in the larger sense all over the place and CDAL is not exempt from those stresses. But that's, that's what I have to report until next time. Okay, thank yeah. you, thank you, Benjamin. This yeah, is a course. really important partnership. And we really appreciate the it's, time that you spend as our delegate. It's so essential. Um, you know, so many of our home district students find their home at CEDAW. And that may not be necessarily um, anywhere near Libertyville or Vernon Hills. Some of our students um, are at one of the many CEDAW properties or are, um, you know, taught at uh, other uh, 
like the, within the consortium of schools that's part of CDAL on site at their schools. So um, it's just interesting sometimes to put yourself in the shoes of these students or these families who send their kids um, to CDAL programs all throughout Lake County, but reside here in district and to understand what that really does mean for them on a day-to-day -day basis and what those experiences are like. So grateful to be a part of it. It's always a fulfilling role that I get to, you know, enjoy. So thank you. Well, we appreciate the time you spend doing of it. Of course. Okay. Um, future agenda items are listed. Um, are there any additional items uh, that we would like to discuss? As noted earlier, I will add the data from the um, calendar uh, from the parents, yep. and that will be an agenda item for the PNP meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, then we are looking for a motion to convene in closed session for the purpose of discussing employment of an employee under 5 ILCS 120 2C1, as well as collective negotiating matters under 5 ILCS 120 2C2. Carmichael, so moved. Rooney, second. Thank you. Roll call, please. Benjamin. Aye. Carmichael. Aye. Drumkey. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Rooney. Aye. Motion passes. We will take a quick five minute bio break and then convene in closed session. Afterwards, um, we will uh, be voting on a resolution authorize, authorizing a notice to remedy when we return to open session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This weekend about killed me. <laughs> I can hang with 20 somethings for one night. Multiple nights is a problem. Ready? I'm ready. Okay, at 9 26 p.m., I'd like to ask for a motion and a second to return to open session. So moved. Rooney, so moved. Carmichael, second. Great. Voice vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are reconvened in open session. Um, may I have a motion to approve the resolution authorizing a notice to remedy for Jamie Rubin? Rooney, so moved. So moved. Benjamin, second. Thank you. Roll call, please. I'm sorry. I had to update. So Rooney and then Benjamin, please. Yes. And um, Carmichael, aye. Drumkey, aye. Hessel, aye. Rooney, aye. Benjamin, aye. Motion passes. I'd like to ask for a motion and second to adjourn the board meeting at 9:27 p.m. Drumkey, so moved. Carmichael, second. Voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. adjourned.